66 million years ago, the asteroid that ended the reign of the dinosaurs struck with unimaginable force. However, it wasn't just a cataclysm. This strike ignited the magical fabric of all persisting realities, Memoriam, kicking the imminent evolutionary boom into overdrive. In the accelerated evolutionary chaos that followed, survivors clawed their way into the future, forging new paths for evolution some giving rise to the creatures we know today, but others took a very different route, creatures that would redefine the rules of survival. We shall cover the time approximately 10 million years after the calamity, as I introduce you to the fully fledged geoliths and aetheropterans, two of evolution's most extraordinary success stories. Two entirely new evolutionary marvels emerged in the wake of disaster. The geolith clade, of mighty creatures of rock-infused biology hailing from the shallow interior seas of the Cretaceous North America, arose from small, squat, semi-aquatic amniotes feeding in rich riverbed and seafloor minerals and sediments, developed organs able to filter nutrients from the soil itself, slowly transitioning to fill the niche brought on by this new food source entirely. Aetheropterans, an order of ancient insects from what will become East Asia, whose fast metabolisms drove an evolutionary pressure on greater respiratory efficiency, leading to a bird-like system of air sacs pressurized by muscle contraction, developed from the open system these insects possessed previously. The genus Endochondrids, the most successful genus of Aetheropteran, whose skeletons internalized into bone-like structures as their powerful musculature developed greater attachment points. This, along with the supercharged bird-like respiratory system built upon their open system, allowed these creatures to grow larger than any of their insect predecessors. As these creatures spread, they reshaped ecosystems, outcompeted ancient lineages, and even drove some species to extinction. Let us journey across the world to see how they changed everything. Tropical rainforests, the canopy war, geoliths, especially the largest, failed to thrive due to the nutrient poor soil in the rainforests, though small species closer related to the dwarves of Northern America, like Lithobrachis obscura, migrated south across the narrow seaway between the American continents, some survived by forming symbiotic relationships with fungi that break down tree bark into soil in the upper canopy. Aetheropterans like Velocuptum arboris, a dragonfly-like aerial predator, evolved short wings and a wide tail flute for greater dexterity, along with shorter claws to catch small prey. Arboris hunted small birds in the canopy, leading to a sharp decline in many primitive avian species across their wider range. However, larger birds of prey such as harpy eagles would be unaffected by this new, smaller predator. One other interesting species of Aetheropteran, evolving in the humid rainforests of East Asia, is Viaportus progenitus, which uses its long appendages to climb around trees, feeding on other insects, enhancing the bark layers. Most small birds more marked declines in their numbers and evolutionary spread due to the competition and predation with Aetheropterans. However, in the North and South American continents, birds would remain a commonplace species. Savannas, the age of walking boulders. Pterolithus fortis, the second largest terrestrial geolith, grew to its grand stature in its unchallenged niche after migrating south, partitioning from its smaller relatives in Laurasia. They headed south into the newly forming savannas of Africa, where its foraging habitats opened up easier feeding for elephants and other proboscideans and ungulates, as well as any other larger herbivores as the geoliths consumed mineral-rich deposits, unearthing deep-growing tumours and roots. As Aeroscutum velox migrated into the African continent, the large Aetheropterans began to hunt mammals, filling a similar niche to the now-extinct Harst's eagle of New Zealand, hunting the young of the largest grazing species, as well as any other medium-sized creatures, eventually reaching their mighty size you can see now. Many grazing mammals thrived due to the shifts in plant availability, evolving digging behaviours to feed on the loose earth left by geoliths. The savannah burrowers like ground squirrels, aardvarks and monitor lizards 
would have to burrow deeper and wider burrows to avoid collapse from geolith feeding. Wild termites would have to evolve greater chemical defences and even retain their wings so that they could swarm large geoliths eyes and mouths to deter them from eating their homes. Deserts, the slow and the survivors. As Terolithus genus spread across Laurasia, they encountered the relatively arid lands that would become the Gobi Desert. Terolithus siccus, a large, slow-moving geolith, stores water in mineralized tissue, allowing it to survive extreme droughts of the Gobi Desert. And it has a hardened palate to eat tough or sharp plants. Its large structure and ponderous movements allow other animals to use it as shelter from the sun, wind, and sands. Aerovenator flamius, an Aetheropteran evolved as a specialised hunter of other birds like falcons and kestrels. It has long, narrow wings built for high speed and a powerful thoracic muscles enabling rapid bursts of acceleration, while its large forward-facing eyes can detect polarised light allowing it to spot falcons against the bright sky. It also possesses spined, mantis-like forelimbs designed to snatch and immobilise prey mid-air. Scutilocrypta nocturna was a burrowing ambush predator, feeding on small species such as gerbils and lizards, leading to a rise in insect burrowing and ambush adaptations. Many small desert mammals evolved greater speed and rudimentary forms of tremosense. Predatory birds was also evolved to become nocturnal, as they preferred hunting when the endothermic Aetheropteran predators were not active. Wetlands and swamps the amphibian crisis. One genus of semi-aquatic geoliths that evolved to gain the sustenance from minerals within prey instead of the low mineral dense swamp mud, known as Pallidosuchus, competed fiercely with crocodilians, with some swamps dominated by carnivorous geoliths rather than the traditional reptiles, especially across the Americas, though crocodilians still spread from the rest of the world. With the increased competition and larger prey sites, crocodilomorphs tended to increase in size. Crocodilus titus used this newfound size not only in direct competition with the geolith counterparts, but also the larger body size helps with thermoregulation, a phenomenon known as gigantothermy or inertial homeothermy. This means that big animals retain their heat better to maintain a stable body temperature, which in turn allows them to become more active predators. Amphibians struggled, adapting be defensive behaviours over their young as Aetheropterans preyed upon their tadpoles and their small adults, increasing amphibian extinction rates. This led many amphibian species to decline, struggling against predation, though the increased effort into childcare, leading to closer to a case selection strategy, allowed many amphibians to reach new peaks in success. Some crocodilian species vanished due to the competition with the aquatic geoliths though Africa, Asia and Oceania all remained crocodilian dominated. Tundra and ice wastes, stone beasts of the cold. Terolithus glacis, a true titan and largest of all geoliths, sp speciated from its closest relative, Terolithus siccus, as their population migrated north into the proto-Siberian steppe, tearing up trees and feeding on their roots. And as the world grew colder, they became larger still. Geoliths failed to maintain footholds in the truly polar regions, however, as the permafrost prevents them from feeding upon the earth with any regularity. Insect clades were also unable to conquer the cold as their size and metabolism actually worked against them in this situation. Temperate forests, the stone giants of the woods. Arboreal geoliths, such as Lithobrachis sylvanus, another close relative of the dwarves, clambered among the trees, burrowing into the redwoods and tapping the veins for sustenance, never even stepping foot on the forest floor hundreds of feet below. American redwood forests are also the biggest home of the birds as they manage to outcompete any larger Aetheropterans that tried to migrate westwards into the Americas and fed upon the smaller basal species who inhabited the woodlands, looking much more like the Archaeopteryx instead of traditional modern-day birds. Oceans and coasts, a new leviathan. 
dwarven relatives found niches in the shallow, nutrient-rich seabeds, returning to the seas where they compete with much smaller filter feeders for territory. One such group of geoliths, the Saxopontus, developed armour to protect from predators and consequently are beginning to develop folded feathery lung structures inside the water-filled chambers to enable oxygen absorption underwater, as surfacing in deep water for air would be impossible due to these creatures' immense sizes. These geoliths wreaked havoc on coral reef formations, eating the calcium-rich structures. Thus, many species of coral, to avoid extinction, began to embed on the slow-moving genus instead, becoming known as the Wandering Reefs. The Soliastus genus, closely related to the Paleodususus genus from the swamps, took to the deeper waters of the Central Atlantic Ocean, evolving gigantism to combat the cold and using the signature geolith filament structures or beards to filter feed on microscopic algae and zooplankton. Aetheropteran insects became the surfix skimming predators such as Aeroscutum pelagicus, disrupting seabird populations. The largest impact of marine geoliths is the near extinction of coral reefs embedded in the sea floor instead of inhabiting the geoliths themselves. Some marine reptiles disappeared as well, unable to compete with the mineral feeding geoliths. And certain coastal seabirds went extinct, outcompeted by the surface hunting lunged insects. However, those species of bird less limited to the land and seafaring birds continued to thrive. As you can see, habitats across the globe are very different to their counterparts 65 million years ago. Though often giant, the geoliths are the least impactful in general, as they inhabit a completely novel niche. Their greatest impacts stem from their habitat sculpting behaviours. The insect takeover is by far the most altering change in this world, as these highly efficient, strong creatures outcompete many commonplace species, meaning that when we eventually evolve this world towards modern day, entire families are to be extinct, or at least largely decimated. Birds are the biggest loss, as the insects have already outcompeted them from many of their common niches, as well as many reef creatures are also being lost, as they are unable to hide among the rocks and crevices surrounded by bountiful reefs that no longer exist. In the following videos of this mini-series, I will take you through the developments through the ages. We will see the rise of mammals in this world, and how the change world reacts to the natural disaster and ecological change. And finally, how humanity itself is affected by this new world.